So we are in week four of this series. We've been talking about change and about how we change and how we can make change easier on ourselves because it's kind of difficult sometimes to change, is it not? And you know, when you think about life in general, I don't think anybody plans with their life to screw up. I don't think anybody ever plans to fail. I don't think anybody ever plans uh, to, to just have a bad life, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says to themselves, let me see how I can screw things up today, right? It's not something that we try to do. It just happens, right? Somehow we still manage to make a mess out of our lives. We're not trying, we're not putting energy or effort towards screwing things up, and yet somehow we still end up living paycheck to paycheck. And then the car breaks down, and now we're into more debt, and we're still waiting for the paycheck. And we have damaged relationships, right? And, and things aren't going well, and I don't really have any friends anymore, or... The family doesn't get along like we used to, or, you know, I'm, I'm overweight and I'm always going to be unhealthy. I'm always going to struggle with my weight. I always am going to feel lost and broken and defeated or addicted. We don't plan on having a life with those adjectives. Nobody wants that life, and yet somehow we still end up there. How? I think the simple answer is it's one bad decision, it's one misstep, it's one bad habit at a time. One little thing at a time. It leads us down a road where we find destruction, where we find devastation, frustration, chaos, ruin. Isn't it funny how you know, it, it takes a long time I and mean, it takes a lot of steps and a lot of poor judgment calls and a lot of bad decisions to get to where we are. But people will describe it in a single sentence as if it was one thing that you did that completely screwed up your entire life. Right? Like he was a womanizer and uh, he had lustful eyes and that's why he ruined his marriage. Or she started using again and. She lost her job and then ended up arrested and thrown in jail. Or, you know, he's always struggled with eating and he really likes the sweets. So it's no wonder he was overweight and had a heart attack and died before he was 60. Right? People will describe it with a single sentence as if it was one thing that you did that led to that. But the truth is, it was over time. Right? It was a process in which it was one bad decision that led to a bad habit that led to another bad decision and another bad habit that gets us into those circumstances. Eventually, it leads you down a road that's a very destructive road, and we get to the point where it just feels unrecoverable. And then we begin to describe ourselves in that way to say, this is just who I am. I'm always going to struggle with. I'm always going to. It's just me. And there's actually a biblical example of this in Judges 16. And it's somebody that everybody knows. And I'm not going to read Judges 16, but if you want to read it later, go, go ahead and read it. You'll see what I'm talking about. But this particular person was a very, very powerful Person. In fact, he was set apart specifically for service to God. He was an incredibly strong person who had incredible potential and incredibly luscious, long, beautiful hair. And you know who I'm talking about now, that being Samson. Right? In the end, it cost him his hair, his strength his name, his power, his eyesight, and his life. Samson was the son of Manoah, and he was from a town called Zorah. And if you read, Samson's parents were barren. Samson's parents prayed. They wanted a child. Samson was born. And, and Samson was under what was called the Nazarite vow. 
to his parents as a way to dedicate him to God for the blessing of having a child. The Nazarite vow was very specific things that, for, right from birth, things that he could do, things that he didn't do, um, according to that vow, just to show that he was set apart. He was different. He was in service to God. As a result, God gave Samson incredible power. He was incredibly strong, and God was going to use Samson as his tool to deliver Israel from the Philistines. So how did Samson, under this Nazarite vow, incredibly strong person with a purpose, right, to deliver Israel from the Philistines, how did he, with so much promise and so much potential, end up broken, losing his eyesight, losing his strength, and eventually dead? And the answer is, he didn't do it all at once. It was one bad decision. It was one misstep. It was one bad habit after another. In fact, you could argue that Samson did it in about 45,000 steps in the wrong direction. If you read Judges 16.1, it says that Samson went to Gaza, and in Gaza he found a prostitute, and he slept with the prostitute. You see, if Samson was from, in fact, Zorah, and he went to Gaza, it's about 25 miles. Gaza is enemy territory for Samson. He had no business being there. That's where the Philistines were. That's the enemy, right? And he's walking 25 miles, about 45,000 steps into enemy territory where he's public enemy number one. They want Samson gone. Samson is defeating the Philistines. We want to get rid of him, but no one no one to do anything. So we're afraid of Samson because of his strength and he can't be beat. But it was 45,000 steps he took in the wrong direction, doing something that he shouldn't have done. And this wasn't the root cause of Samson losing his strength, but this was the start of one bad decision after another and another and another that eventually led to his unraveling. Again, I don't think anybody wakes up and wants to have a bad life. Nobody plans to fail. No one wants to be addicted. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to struggle Nobody wants to hate their job or have little money or, or live a life of mediocrity where failure and total collapse feel like they're, they're just around the corner. Nobody wants that. But it still happens. And again, it happens one bad step, one bad decision, one bad habit at a time. Now, if we recap our study briefly, if you haven't been here for the last few weeks, we've talked about the idea of change and making change and why it's so difficult and what we can do to help with that process. In the first week, we talked about how real and lasting change, when we want to change, we talk about modifying our behavior, but true, real and lasting change isn't about behavior modification. It's about spiritual transformation. And when there is something that we need to change, when we decide, hey, I, I need to change, we need to make it spiritual. So instead of just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm overweight and it's swimsuit season in a couple months, I need to drop a few pounds. So I need to look good in a swimsuit. Right? Well, let, let's make it spiritual. Let, let's talk about the fact that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that I need to change and make myself healthy so that I can live longer and serve God. Or, you know, I, I just want to get out of debt. I'm tired of living paycheck to paycheck. And yeah, that's a good reason, but let's make it spiritual. Right? Let's talk about how the scripture teaches that the borrower is slave to the lender. And how I want to live and give generously. And in order to do that, I need to be a good steward of my resources. Right? So we're attaching a spiritual why to the thing that we want to change. We make it spiritual. So instead of just modifying our behavior we are trying to transform ourselves spiritually. And we talked about why, why it is that we are the way we are, right? Why we do 
what we do and how we do what we do because of what we think of ourselves. You do what you do because of what you think about you. Right? And if I, if I think and if I truly believe that I'm always going to struggle with my weight, I've been a chubby kid, I, I've always been a little husky, you know, that's, that was the polite way of calling someone fat back in the day when I was a kid. Just a little husky. Big boned, right? I've always been big and I struggle with sweets. I'm just, I'm always going to be big. And if you think that about yourself, then yes, you're always going to be big. So we have to change the way we view ourselves and understand that we're not defined by the world. We're not defined by even ourselves. We are defined by God. So we change the way that we think about ourselves in order to change our habits. And then based on the person that I want to become, we talked about our habits and how we need to change what we do to become the person that we want to become. So last week, we talked about the one habit. What is one positive habit? One thing that you can do now that will make you become the person that you want to become. So one positive habit. So we talked last week, and if you weren't here last week or any of the weeks and you want to watch them, all the messages are on our YouTube channel. Get online, go to YouTube, even Church of the Brethren. You'll find it. You can re-watch it. But last week, we talked about our habits. What is one thing that I can do that will make me become the person I want to become? So doing a positive thing, the what to do. Today, we're talking about the what not to do. We're talking about breaking bad habits. So based on the person that I want to become, what is one habit that I need to break? James 1, 21 and 22, James writes, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If our goal, right, our, our goal is to change, but if our true goal is spiritual transformation, legitimate, long-lasting change via spiritual transformation, enabling us, right, to do the will of God, to obey the will of God, and to be witnesses to the world around us, the best way to start is by breaking the negative or the bad habits that are holding us back, the destructive things. As James says, to put away Right, to get rid of, to, to, to destroy any kind of filthy or rampant or wicked thing that is within us. Those negative, those evil things that are holding us back. So if our goal is that, right, if we're going to defeat the negative habits, then we have to begin how? Well, by identifying the negative habits. Right? Because we can't defeat something that we can't define. So we have to first identify, define those negative habits that are preventing us from achieving our goals. Based on the person that I want to be, what is one negative habit that I can break that's going to give me, it might not give me all the way there, but it's going to give me one step closer. Right? The objective is to become that person, but it's not going to necessarily happen overnight. Change doesn't happen immediately. So what is one thing that I can do that's going to get me one step closer, one negative habit that I can break? Right? Because I do struggle. We have to identify. Identify the thing that's holding you back. If it is weight loss, right? what's holding you back? Is it your diet? Is it the sweet tooth? Is it the sugar, because I like it when I eat the cupcake and the frosting that makes my teeth feel all gritty because there's all that sugar in it. And then all them endorphins and the buzz that I get from the cupcake, right? And maybe it's an attitude thing, right? Maybe I'm trying to change, but I have a tendency of being overly critical of people. Or maybe I'm the person that lets one person's opinion affect my entire day. And now I'm off and I'm in a mood all day because of one bad experience with with one person for five minutes. Maybe it is an addiction. Maybe, maybe it's a digital addiction. Maybe it's your phone. Maybe it's 
video games, maybe every time you're home and in the house the television's on. Right? And sometimes these things can even compound, right? Because when I'm at home, i got to turn the TV on, and there's nothing on, so I turn on the news, and I watch the news, and it ruins my entire day, and it screws up my mood. And then because my mood's screwed up, I go to the cupboard and get the brownies. <laughs> what is one habit that you need to break that's going to get you closer to the person that you have been called to be in Christ, one habit. And why is it that developing good habits is so difficult? But at the same time, picking up bad habits is so doggone easy. Why is it? And I'll tell you, it's a matter of pain and pleasure. Picking up good habits is so hard, and picking up difficult habits is so easy because of pain and pleasure. Because the fact of the matter is, the good habit, the pain is now, and the pleasure comes later. With the bad habit, the pleasure is now, but later is the pain. Right? When we talk about good habits, and maybe I'm trying to lose weight, and my diet's not all that bad, but I don't exercise. I don't do any kind of exercise. I go to work, I sit in the chair at work, I get home, and I sit in the chair at home, so... I'm trying to develop a good habit of exercising, but it's January and it's cold, so I'm not running. It's too cold outside, so instead I go to the gym, but then i got to wake up early in the morning and I'm exhausted and tired and I don't feel like it, and so I just don't go to the gym because I've been going to the gym now for a week and I, my whole body's sore and I feel like I can't move and I've been on the scale twice and it hasn't changed, Right? The pain to the good habit is right now. Later, eventually, weeks away, months away, there's pleasure because now the scale is moving. And my clothes are fitting loosely and I feel healthier and I have more energy. The good habit, the pain is now and the pleasure is later. But the bad habit, I don't feel like working out and I don't want to get up early and do those things. And the brownies taste delicious. Right? The pleasure is now, but later there's the pain of I'm overweight and I get exhausted just trying to get on the floor and play with my kids and my grandkids and I got bad news from the doctor and another medication that I have to go on. There's, there's one thing that in my life I'm trying to get a little more conscientious of and that is how much time I spend on my phone. Anybody else struggle with the cell phone thing? And let me put it into perspective for you. And this was very humbling for me because I don't know about the Android thing. I'm spiritual, so I have an iPhone. Um, but that, that was heresy. I say that. But I have an iPhone, right? So I don't know about the Android stuff. But my iPhone every Sunday morning gives me a what? A screen time report tells me how much time on average I've spent on my phone. And then if I really want to know, I can click on that and I can go in and it shows me each individual app. You know, I spent 15 minutes a day playing Sudoku and I spent an hour a day on Facebook or whatever it is, it breaks it down. So the week that I wrote this message, my average screen time per day on my phone is three hours and 32 minutes. And that is the average amount of time that my phone screen is active. So technically right now, this is recording a screen time, right? This week, just a, about an hour or so ago, I got the report that it was 3 hours and 36 minutes. So even though it's up a little bit from two weeks ago when I wrote this, it was still down from last week. So it gives me those reports so I can stay a little conscientious of my screen time. So I got looking into this, and did you know that the average American, right now I, I understand and I admit, some people it's way low, some people it's way high, but on average, an American looks at their cell phone 96 times a day. 96 times a day. Do you know what the average screen time is in America? It's about four hours. So I'm below average. Right? I got some work to do to, to get up there, but 
Four hours a day is the average screen time for an American. Now do the math on that. 365 days a year times four hours is 1,460 hours a, a year that Americans spend on their phone. Now if you assume, now I was in my early 20s when the smartphone came out, but let's say somebody gets a smartphone at 18 which is a little conservative because there are nine, seven, eight, nine-year-olds that have cell phones now. And, and I'll admit my son at 10 is one of them. But at, at 18 years old, you get a phone and you die at 78. 60 years you had that phone and you averaged four hours a day screen time on your phone. So let's say 1,460 hours a year times 60 years is 87,600 hours of your life you spent on that phone divided by a 24 hour day. That's 3,650 days. 10 years of your life was spent doing this. Pretty pathetic, isn't it? It wasn't a one-time failure. It proves my point. It's one little misstep, one poor decision, one bad habit after another that leads to our mistakes. So if it's the bad habit that we're trying to get rid of while we at the same time develop good habits, how do we break the bad habits and reinforce the good habits? Proverbs 4.14 says, Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in their way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. How do we break the bad habits and reinforce the good habits? It's quite simple. We make the good habits really easy. And we make the bad habits really difficult. So how do you do that? Well, we do that by removing the cue. If you were here last week, we talked about that cue cycle, right? There's a cue and that cue generates within us a craving, and that craving generates a response, and the response generates a reward. I gave you the example of my dog. When we are getting ready to leave the house, and we grab a treat and tell her to go to bed. That's her cue to go to her crate. She goes to her crate because she gets that craving for that treat that we give her when we put her in her crate. And she runs to her crate. She's rewarded with a treat, and that treat generates that response to, hey, i got to get to the crate because I want the treat. So there's a cue for you and for me. So if you want to stop doing something bad, if you want to break a bad habit, remove the cue. Remove the thing that's cueing you into that bad habit. And you have to figure out what that cue is for you. What is the thing that is, that is cueing you into the bad habit? And there are several, several different things that can do this. Right? Sometimes it's a place. There are specific places that cue us into certain behaviors. As an example, you don't overeat in the gym. You overeat at the buffet, right? Because it was $13.99. I'm going to get my money's worth. Right? You don't drink too much on Sunday morning at church. You drink too much on Friday night with a friend at the bar. Certain places cue us into certain behaviors, some of them good, some of them negative, right? So if that's the case and there's a negative habit that you have that you're trying to break, figure out, is it a place that I'm always doing this negative thing? Remove the cue. And if it is, avoid that place. Sometimes it's specific times, right? There are certain times of the day that cue us into uh, negative habits and negative behaviors, I will say you are far less likely to look at pornography or look lustfully after a woman uh, early in the morning when you're by yourself traveling to and from work. But late at night when you're by yourself at home and there's nothing going on, yeah, you're, you're more likely to look at pornography. Or, uh, you know, you're, you're far less likely to drink too much in the middle of the day. 
unless it's Saturday and you're hanging out with friends, and then maybe that's a, a place cued. But you're more likely to drink at the bar at night. Sometimes the time of day and specific times can cue us into negative behaviors. Sometimes it's your mood, right? I'm just in a mood. And, and they'll tell you to halt, H-A-L-T, right? Halt. It's, I'm hungry, I'm angry, <clears throat> I'm lonely, and I'm tired. And that's why my kids aren't here this morning. I think they're all four of those things after a week at the fair. But, but those are the four most common moods that we're in that, that cue us into negative behaviors. Hunger, anger, loneliness, or exhaustion. I'm just tired, right? But, but maybe it's something different. There are plenty of other moods that you could be in. If it is a specific mood, you know that, hey, I noticed that every time I do this negative thing before that, I felt like this, right? So if it's a specific mood that is cueing you into that negative habit, then try to avoid the mood, or when you see, hey, I'm starting to feel hungry, I need a Snickers, right? To avoid that negative habit. Sometimes it's specific moments, right? Certain moments or certain things that happen in our lives that cue us into that negative behavior, right? It's a, an argument with a spouse, and you get on the phone, and you call your friend, and and you start bashing your spouse. Or maybe it's, again, it's the, the after work thirsty Thursday. And then Friday at work is miserable because you're hungover. Right? It, it's a certain moment at work. Or you failed the project at work. So you went to the store and bought a half gallon of ice cream and ate half of it to try and console yourself. Or I was successful with the project at work. So I went and bought a half gallon of ice cream to celebrate. <laughs> right? What is it? Maybe it's a certain moment in life or a certain thing that happens that cues you into the negative habit. Or maybe it's certain people in your life. People is a really big one. Right? The people that you hang out with. In fact, there are no shortage of studies that correlate a person's behavior to the people that they hang around with most. In fact, there's one study that found that your chances of being overweight increase 57% if one of your closest friends is overweight. And in fact, the exact opposite is true, that if one of your friends in your circle of friends loses weight, everyone else in that circle of friends is 33% more likely to lose weight. In fact, the Bible knows what it's talking about when it says in Proverbs 13, 1, that whoever walks with the wise will become wise, but the command, companion of Fools will suffer harm, right? The people that you hang out with can have an incredible impact on your habits. So what we need to do, based on the person that I want to be, we're going to find one habit that I can start doing, one positive habit that, that I can do. We're going to make it simple, right? Go back and watch last week's message. We're going to make it simple easy to do so I can start doing one positive thing to become the person that I want to become. And then we're going to identify what's one negative <clears throat> habit that's holding me back. And I'm going to try to eliminate that negative habit by identifying the cue to that behavior and removing it. Right? I, maybe I sleep in and I, and I hit snooze five or six times and then it just makes me exhausted. I need to stop hitting snooze. So instead of, you know, putting my cell phone right on the nightstand, right next to the bed, because then I'm up on my phone late, kind of scrolling, trying to wind down. So instead of going to bed early, I'm up on my phone, and then it's right there so that when the alarm goes off, I can hit snooze and roll over. I'm going to put my phone and my alarm on the, on the dresser, on the other side of the room. So I can't be on it scrolling and be up late. And then when the alarm goes off, I have to physically get out of bed to shut it off, or if you're overspending money, right? Amazon Prime Days, and I'm spending too much money. Maybe give your friend your Amazon password and have them change it. So now I don't have access to Amazon. And now I have an accountability person to ask me, hey, do you really need that thing that you want me to buy for you on Amazon? Or, or take your credit cards and freeze them, right? Dave Ramsey will tell you to literally freeze them. 
Take a cup and fill it with water and put your credit card in it and put it in the freezer. Right? Because if it's just turning it on and off on my phone, if I want to spend, I can just flip it on real quick and, and spend. But if it's in a frozen container in the freezer and not in my Apple wallet, but if it's in a frozen container in the freezer, now I have to pull it out and actually let it thaw. That gives me some time to think, do I really need this? Right? Or, or if it's too much screen time, again, I, I don't know the Android thing. It confuses me. But on my iPhone, I can set up screen time controls in individual apps so that if I'm on that app for more than a certain period of time, it shuts the app down. Right? So do things to remove the negative habits in your life. Stop trying to simply overcome the temptation. Instead, remove the temptation all together. The habits that we have today are shaping the person that we are going to become in the future. And if that's true, let me ask you, do you like the direction that your current habits are taking you? And if the answer is yes, then just keep doing what you're doing. Right? Sorry I held your attention for this long. You didn't have to be here. But, but if you think to yourself, I wish I was a little different. In the future, I wish I was a little better of a person. I wish I was, I was better off. I wish, I wish I was more like Jesus. I wish I was more caring. I wish I was more loving. I, I just wish I was different. Then it starts by changing your habits today. Right? Samson took 45,000 steps in the wrong direction. But it was also 45,000 chances for him to stop and turn and go back to God. Right? Because we, we also have a chance to turn and go back to God. We have a chance to change the trajectory of our life, to change the person that we are going to be in the future. Because we are not defined by the things that, that we do, right? We are defined how God defines us. We're talking about spiritually changing ourselves to be the person or the people that Christ has called us to be. There's hope for you and for me. And there's hope for our habits. And I get this sometimes, it's hard. But the great thing about it is that God's power, as he said to Paul, God's power is made perfect, not in our strength or in our own abilities, but his power is made perfect in our weakness. And God's power is greater than our patterns and our habits. There is no habit that is too bad or too hard for the healing power of God to change. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the truth in that. Because Lord, it is incredibly difficult. And you know us, you know this. It is incredibly difficult for us to to change. It's difficult for us to pick up good habits because the good habits are just so difficult to do and it's so easy for us to pick up negative, uh, dangerous habits. Lord, I, I pray that as we try to change our lives, as we hope to change, we understand, we recognize that hope doesn't change a person, but habits do. I pray that your spirit would help us to identify and maybe areas of our life where we need to develop some new, positive, good habits. And areas in our life where we need to say, these are negative habits and, and they're not helping, but they're hindering me. And I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage and the motivation and the persistence to make the changes that we need to make, to change the habits that are holding us back and to develop the habits that are pushing us forward to become the people that we want to be, the people that you have called us to be. God, give us that strength and that, <clears throat> that courage <clears throat> this week to make those changes and to be who you've called us to be, the light in the world and the salt of the earth. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time. I thank you for the people that are here today. I pray that you would be with those who are not with us this morning. For any reason, God, protect us, 
watch over us, give us strength and courage to face this week and bring us back here safely next week is my prayer, Lord. And I lift it up to you in all things in Jesus' name. Amen.